So let's get started. We have some material to cover. So first, hello everybody. My name is Andre Ionescu and I'm a senior software engineer with Adobe working on Adobe Experience Platform on the data lake and ingestion. This talk is about data processing and how we can have a better processing workflow using Apache Spark Stateful Streaming together with the control plane information, the metadata, to better schedule data processing. I'll start by presenting Adobe Experience Platform. I don't know if you have been present at my previous talk where I talk a bit about it. I'll be doing it again, presenting Adobe Experience Platform, but shortened to set the context that we would better understand the technical challenges and solutions. After this brief presentation, we will talk about control plane and data plane and the benefits of having them separated. And then we will get into the general architecture of the tracking and triggering pattern, introducing you to the tracker concept and application. Then digging into Apache Spark state for streaming and why we did choose it for it. Lastly, we'll get into the trackers internals like the internal architecture, the components, how does it work, what has been great, some weak points, and a demo at the end. So let's get started. Adobe Experience Platform is a data platform providing real-time personalized experiences. Producers, including our customers, partners, and internal solutions send data through either a batch or a streaming interface. The type of data sent to us includes profile data, such as CRM system data, dimensional data, such as product catalogs, and time series data, such as quick stream data for your website. When data is sent via batch through a bulk ingest APR or connectors, it is validated, transformed, partitioned, compressed before being written out to the data lake. Downstream consumers will be notified when data is ripe, and they can then query that data from the lake. Then it also can be sent over streaming using our pipeline service. That data will be validated, transformed before being made available downstream and also being forked off into the data lake. The customers are mostly our own solutions, unified profile, unified identity, experience query service, data science, workbench, customer journey, analytics, etc. And I won't get into the details of each of them. What is important is the fact that all are consuming data from the data lake using multiple different workflows. For all this to work seamlessly, we have to separate planes, the control plane and the data plane. Control plane provides management and orchestration across Adobe Experience Platform. This is where configuration baselines are set, user and role access is provisioned, metadata is routed, and application seat so they can execute and work together with related services. Data plane is responsible for forwarding, moving, processing data from one place to another according to what has been set up on the control plane level. So in our use case, data grows to data plane and metadata and settings go through control plane. There are multiple benefits of having two planes. And I'll go through a few next. First is the separation of concerns. Customer data is kept clean, unpolluted by our internal metadata. And in the same time, we limit the possibility of touching customer's data. Next, the separate scaling with better option. We have different infrastructure for data plane, which is hundreds of times more demanding than the control plane infrastructure and each of them can be scaled differently. Thirdly, separate cost modeling. This allows us to properly calculate the cost for customers and data processing and keep for ourselves the cost implied by the metadata processing and storage. Now let's have a look at the general architecture. As we already seen, we do have two planes and on the left, we have two Kafka topics used to transport bytes for each plane. I'm showing only these two topics, but in fact, we have multiple topics for each plane. 
the data lands as raw data unprocessed, and this helps us to minimize the pressure on Kafka infrastructure and minimizes the cost because storage space is among the cheapest. Then a bit later, it gets processed and optimized as needed. Now, there comes the tracker. This is the core component application that tracks information about the data. And from now on, we will focus on the tracker. It receives events with metadata, extracts the important metrics, groups and aggregates over those metrics, and based on defined rules, it decides when to trigger the data processing jobs. The worker or the processing job gets triggered by the tracker and loads the data, processes and optimizes it, and outputs the result usually as another chunk of data, storing it in the data lake, ready for efficient consumption. It is important to note that the tracker works with metadata and does not touch the data while the job does the opposite, works with data and tries to touch the metadata as little as possible. The tracker is a long running app, runs uninterrupted for months, is implemented using Apache Spark and leverages the stateful streaming concepts from Spark. It is a multi-tenant application that touches only the metadata and in terms of number of records, it processes hundreds of thousands of records per minute. The worker is a short lived process in the interval of minutes up to hours, works with data, can be implemented using any framework, although we do use Spark for this tool to leverage the distribution, distributed processing aspect of Spark. It is single tenant and processes tens of millions of records. For the tracker, we choose Apache Spark state for streaming. Why did we do that? First, exactly once processing comes with Apache Spark structure streaming and with stateful streaming. Transformation, which is in itself, in itself a particular property of Spark streaming. This exactly once processing is critical for us because we are required to be as accurate as possible when ingesting and processing customers' data. Without exactly once processing warranties, we will end up with duplicate data, thus needing another process to clean duplicates later on. The auto scaling option of Apache Spark is another important feature that we took into account. If more metadata events are needed to be processed, Spark easily uses more executors to scale horizontally to accommodate the workload. Spark operates on data in fault-tolerant file system like HDFS or S3. So all the RDDs generated from fault-tolerant data are fault-tolerant. If due to a worker node failure, any partition of a RDD is lost, then that partition can be recomputed from the original fault-tolerant dataset using the lineage of operations. And in the end, and maybe one of the most important benefits of Apache Spark, it's low maintenance. The start is worry-free as the immediate processing state is kept and used for resuming after it starts. In terms of incidents, we had just a few in a couple of years running it in production, and we are not doing any management of the storage needed for the Spark internal state. Spark does this by itself. The tracker architecture is composed of few steps or components. It has a serialization deserialization section where Kafka records are transformed into normalized data objects called accumulator row. The next component, it's processing all these normalized objects, grouping them by a specific key, aggregating metric, metrics, and resulting in an accumulator row group object. The last component is the decision in component which decides if it needs to trigger some work or not. Regarding the flow between these components, it starts with reading JSON, JSON metadata events from Kafka, gathering extra information from external services to fill up important fields and creating our own representation called accumulator row, as we already seen. Then we map and group accumulator row objects into actionable internal state representation called accumulator row group, based on which we will decide whether to trigger or not the processing job. The decision is made based on 
accumulator row groups metrics and our own defined rules, which can be static or dynamically modified. If the decision to trigger is taken and successful, for example, we receive back a 200 OK response after an HTTP call, then we can, we can discard the state. Otherwise, we keep the state for the next slow query execution, which in our use case is after four minutes. The query executes every four minutes, but it can be customized as desired. By keeping the state, in the case of unsuccessful trigger, after multiple retries, we make sure that we don't lose data, nor stop processing. Now let's get through each component. The serialization deserialization process we've briefly seen before takes JSON and from Kafka and transforms it into accumulator row. The events coming from Kafka topic may contain more information than necessary. So we extract only what we need when creating the accumulator row object. Our implementation reads JSON, but it can accommodate protobuf too. And any type of Kafka message can be deserialized and normalized into accumulator row. The get additional info is a process of augmenting the already received event with important information that is not lending to the topic. Sorry. And is not attached to the metadata event. This may include information about the owner, about the table, or any other information. And our implementation uses cached REST API calls to retrieve the needed information. At this point, we are also retrieving the external overrides will override if there are any. If this step of gathering extra information fails, we can either discard the event and continue processing with the next event, ignore the missing fields by providing some defaults or fail the process, depending on whether the additional information is mandatory or not. Our implementation uses defaults for the mandatory fields that couldn't be augmented at this step. So we don't stop or break, we just continue processing. The accumulator row is the result of the previous normalizing process and contains the following information. The table ID for which this, is a, this event is for, the details about the owner of the data, for example, an owner ID, the ID of the chunk of data that it represents, the type of the event, like append, delete, update, the timestamp and other important metrics like number of records, byte size, number of files, etc. The accumulator row must contain at least the properties that we will use as the key for grouping. Multiple accumulator rows are grouped by the key into accumulator row group that has aggregates over multiple given metrics. An accumulator group will contain also the table ID, the owner details like the owner ID, to contain an array of chunks ID, an array of timestamp, array of types, and aggregates of given metrics like sum of all numbers of records, etc. It is important to know that there will be only one accumulator row group for a given key. The process of grouping multiple accumulator rows in, into accumulator row group is map group with state and is the core of the application. This is a functionality that's of Spark that lets you process data and store state based on that data. You need to provide a mapping function and Spark will route the data through that method. The signature is shown here. And given the key K, the collection of objects of V type and the state S, it outputs a new U type. In our specific case, K is a tuple of table ID and owner ID. V is the accumulator row. So the function receives a collection of accumulator row. S and U are of accumulator row group type. So we store the accumulator row group in the state. The function is called each time the query is executed for each group form, either from previous state or new data. Grouping the accumulator row objects into accumulator row group by the given tuple key of table ID on ID. For now, just keep in mind that map group with state takes multiple accumulator rows and groups them into accumulator row group by the given keys. Let's have a look at, at some code inside this mapping function. First, 
we check if we have some state or the given key. And if so, we process the new events and the state using our internal process values method. If there is no state for the key, meaning that it's a new key, never seen that combination of table ID, owner ID until now, we create a new state for it with an empty accumulator row group, adding on top the new accumulator row objects to the same process values method. Finally, we check if the resulting accumulator row group qualifies to trigger a new worker process. The process values method gets the content of the state and adds to it what is new. So this is the function that does the aggregation. It takes the key, the collection of accumulator rows object and the accumulator row group extracted from the state or the empty one, aggregates the accumulator row matrix and adds those to the accumulator row group, which is automatically placed back into the state by Spark itself. Now, as seen in an earlier uh, slide, like here, the final step is checking if the group qualifies for triggering. This is happening in the check triggering rule step. There are two levels of rules, global and key related rules. The global rules are the default and generally applying rules for all groups, while the key related rules are specific to a key value, table ID, owner ID, or both. This is in the case you need a different rule threshold for that key. For example, for a specific table ID, it is needed to have a more aggressive triggering rule threshold. Rules are composed of conditions and operators. Conditions are value-based and time-based, while operators are currently only OR and AND. Now, here are a couple of rules defined as Hakon strings, which will be transformed in code as you can see on the right. Hakon means human optimized config object notation and is easy to read and understand. And also it can be interpreted by types of config. These rules are defined at the application level. And here I'm talking about the global rules and can be overridden at runtime for the matching keys. The shown rules in this screen mean any group that has more than 2000 files or a byte size greater than one gigabyte qualifies for triggering. The actions that can be triggered from the tracker can be of any type, but we do mostly HTTP calls to start external processing job or publish messages on a separate Kafka topic to signal downstream components. There is also the possibility to start a job right inside the tracker, but we, we don't do that as it will break the separation of concerns and it will add trouble scaling up the application. Based on the information present in the accumulator row group, the metrics that we aggregated, that and that group that has been qualified for triggering, if the future workload is too heavy, it can be split into multiple smaller jobs for easily handle the load. Now, to better understand how the data gets grouped and how the work gets triggered, let's take a look at the following timeline. The setup is this. The tracker runs the query every four minutes and has a rule of triggering work when the accumulated byte size is over one gigabyte of data. On the left side is the time. Every four minutes, the Spark streaming query is executed, and that is why you see multiples of four. We get E1, E2, and E7 events regarding three chunks of data with their respective keys. O1B1, O1B1, O2B2, meaning that owner one table one, owner one table one, and owner two table two. On minute four, when the query is executed, those get grouped into groups G1 and G2. G1 uses O1B1 key and contains E1 and E2 events related to their chunks of data, totaling 200 megabytes. G2 uses O2B2 key and has only E7 ch chunk, totaling 100 megabytes. At this moment, none of the groups are qualified to trigger because 200 megabytes is less than one gigabyte and 100 megabytes is less than one gigabyte. And that's why the red square are next to the both groups. E3 and E8 land and E3 gets into G1, totaling 600 megabytes. And E8 gets into G2, totaling 900 megabytes. 
still not meeting the condition to trigger. Next, E6, E9, and E10 are landing, and E9 and E10 are added to G1 group, while E6 gets added to G2. Now G1 is totaling 1,200 megabytes and G2, 1,100 megabytes, both qualifying to trigger as both have accumulated over one gigabyte of data. As you can see, green square means ready to trigger. In this case, trigger means making an HTTP call to an external service. For G1, all went okay. We got back to 100 response, but for G2, we received 500 error. The G1 group gets cleared, but G2 will be kept because triggering was not successful. Now E12 and E19 land, and because E12 belongs to O2B2 key, it will be added to the G2 that have been keeping from the previous failure. Now G2 will contain E7, E8, E6, and E12. And a new group will be created for E19, named G3 having the O1B5 key. The G2 group has now 1400 megabytes and qualifies for triggering. And this time triggering is successful. We get 200 OK response, so it gets cleared. Lastly, E20 comes in and the new group is created. And now we have G3 and G4 in the internal state. Two groups remaining and waiting for more data to land. So they will qualify for triggering. All these process runs uninterrupted with thousands of groups over and over again. All these look very nice and easy. Are there any drawbacks? Not drawbacks, but there are some complexity associated with this pattern and somewhat weak points. Complexities, the application is a structured application, which means that the queries are structured. They have a fixed structure when processing. This is fixed structure, in fact, is a schema that is used to store the internal state. And because it is fixed, modifying the schema, in our case, for example, changing the accumulator row group to add more metrics will require, will, will require clearing the state as it's not possible to migrate the current state to match the new schema. The second complexity is if your upstream components do not guarantee the uniqueness of metadata events, you need to deduplicate the incoming events so that you won't take into account that data twice. This can be achieved by using drop duplicates action but this slows down the query and adds up to the checkpoint store byte size. Now to some weak points. Losing the checkpoint, deleted by mistake or forced due to state schema migration, may mean data loss. To avoid this, when migrating the state schema, first it is needed to make sure that everything in the state is clear. No accumulator group is kept in the state. Due to the fact that we are receiving data through Kafka topics, if there is a slow Kafka node, that will impact the process, slowing down the whole query. And in the end, if, there, if the application is backed by a slow storage, that will impact the whole query too. Everything will run slower as the stateful streaming and internal state checkpointing is pretty IO intensive from time to time mostly when storage cleanup happens. This pattern of tracking and triggering is suitable for multiple use cases, and I'll just list a few. When you need to optimize the data, either before making it available for reading or afterwards, if you want to optimize the data before, you can use a buffering process of the chunks of data in a temporary storage then optimize the accumulated data before moving it into its permanent location. This process is very helpful in the case of the very well-known small, small file problem. In the case of deriving datasets from infinitely growing source dataset, we could listen for new chunks landing in the source datasets and after a while, executing ETL on them and saving the results in the derived dataset. The next case is oh, in the case of needing to clean up data sets, either due to new rows or rows that are too old to be taken into account or to keep a specific amount of records or byte size or any other cleanup process. You could listen for the landing chunks, aggregate over the metrics, and together with time-based rules, you could trigger cleanup processes 
if you need to have a change data capture process, we have a tracking and triggering pattern with a tracker listening for new data landing as soon as the data is stored and a copy change process to be started to duplicate the changes from the source to the targets. One other use case is if you need to augment data sets, filling up some empty fields. You can use this pattern to detect when new data land and before writing the data, retrieve the external information for the augmenting process. The last use case is when you have hyperspace indexes attached to the data sets, you need to, to update those if the data sets are moving or changed because hyperspace doesn't do that by itself. So you can listen for new data and trigger updates. These are just a few use cases, but this pattern of tracking and triggering is not limited to them. Now, last point in my presentation is cost. The cost of running the tracker, it's um, around 25,000 per year, depending on the traffic. And at Adobe, we do have traffic. So compared with that, the cost is negligible. Splitting the cost by resource type shows us the VM costs the most, followed by the storage and traffic. On the other side, this pattern reduces the cost of downstream components that read the data because of the moment of reading the data, it is ready and optimized for reading. And this cost reduction is very important as more and more data is used by the customers. Finally, here are some resources which you may already know about. The official Apache Spark Structure Steaming Guide, the video series of Tada Gada Das about stateful steaming, and more information about Adobe Experience Platform. Thanks for, for watching these. Now we will switch to a demo and then we will be open for, for Q&A. Okay, so here I have a notebook that will showcase what we've seen. The first cell is just a setup. We need some paths to be set up. We need uh, some generators for data and that is happening in that cell. The first important part is defining our accumulator row and accumulator row group. And you see here something similar with what we've seen in the presentation. We do have the owner ID, the table ID, chunk ID, and the other properties. We do have the metrics, number of files, byte size, and number of records. The next concept is the accumulator row group, which also keeps the two uh, parts of the key, the owner ID and table ID, and then it has aggregates, like array of chunks ID, array of types, total number of records, byte size, and so on. This last part is just a companion object. It's a helper function to help us create empty accumulator row groups. Sorry. Now let's move to the functions. We'll start with the simplest one. This is the ready to trigger function. Uh, this is just a simple Boolean function. It checks that the group total byte size is bigger than one gigabyte. Uh, normally here would be the whole uh, logic for the rule set with conditions, operators and stuff like that, with type safe config and everything, but that would be too big for this uh, demo. So I uh, decided to let that out. So we just have a simple function. If total byte size is bigger than one gigabyte, then that's it. We return true, otherwise it's false. The next function is a trigger function, the one that does an external HTTP call. Uh, it received a URL, an URL and a group. It creates a HTTP client with a payload that is a JSON and executes that request, waiting for a 200 response code. So if we do have a 200 response code, we will return true, otherwise we return false so that we know to keep the state. So this is the process values that we've seen in the presentation. I'll get back to it a bit later. Uh, now let's look at the mapping function. This is a function that is used in the map and group state. It has this signature, 
receive the key, which is a tuple of two strings. The first is owner ID, the second is table ID. It receives a collection of accumulator row and a state. In the state, in the group state, we see that we do have the accumulator row group stored. First, we check if state exists. If there is a state, we use a process value with the key, which is a tuple with the values, which is a collection and the accumulator row group extracted from the state. This method extracts the content of the state, which is an accumulator row group. So we give these parameters to process values. If we don't have any state, we use the same function, but instead of giving an accumulator row, we give it accumulator row group empty, which is an empty object. Now, next is this method. Let's get back to it. This method is the aggregation method, process values. It, have, it, it has the uh, uh, signal with the, the key, which is a tuple, values, and the group. Now it checks first if there are any values. If no values are there, it will just return the group, whatever that group is, empty or something. If there are values, we first enable some aggregate values or variables. And then for each value out of the values collection, we check whether the key matches, like the owner ID match and the table ID match. And if it matches, we just increase the accumulators, we add to those. At the end, we return a new accumulator row, which is a sum of the group, the old group, if there has been any, and the values that we received. This method returns also a new updated accumulator row group. In the mapping function, function, we check if we are ready to trigger. And if we are ready, we just trigger and wait for the response of the trigger function, which is true or false. If it's success, then we remove the state and return an empty accumulator of group. Otherwise, we keep the group for one more run by setting this timeout. Otherwise, if it's not ready to trigger, we keep it the same thing. Let me run this cell. Now let's create the, the stream. We do that by doing Spark read, read stream. And what we do is we read from a JSON folder. We mimic the Kafka streaming by putting in that folder from time to time new files. And Spark will know how to read that and produce a stream for that. So here, this DS dataset will have a collection of rows. The next one is transforming those rows into accumulator row. And we do that here with DS map, each item to be transformed in accumulator row. The third step is grouping those. So we do accumulator row group by this key, owner ID, table ID, and applying the map group with state, putting here the mapping function. Let me execute this. At this moment, the, the streaming is not uh, started. It, it just creates the plan for it. And we can see the structure of it, the schema of each of them. This is just a data frame, it's a data set of row. This one, it's a data set of accumulator row. We start, we, we are already having a some structure and here we do have the accumulator row group, which you can see, we keep the owner ID and table ID the same, which is the key. And then we aggregate on the others. Now to start the stream, we just do this group, right stream. We set it to trigger each 20 seconds. We want to have a faster response. As in our application, we did run it at four or five minutes and we store the checkpoint and the state in this location. And we just say start. Now this is initializing. It won't do anything because no data is landing. I'll just start the JSON streaming. And uh, let me open this. It has a nice graph here. 
uh, in about 20 seconds, we should see some data coming. And we will be looking at this external mocking server for calls. In the meantime, it, it is doing its job. It reads from that folder at each 20 seconds and detects what files are new there. So we already are seeing that we do have some data, right? And it may be two files or two files. Uh, let's see what we do have here. Not yet, it will come in a moment. Is. So we do have this. So we do have this call trigger from the tracker. It says that the owner ID table ID has accumulated these two chunks with this number of bytes, which is about 1.3 gigabyte of data. So it's time to trigger. Another one has come. It's owner ID two with table three. It has three chunks of data and it accumulated more. Uh, data did come faster, so in a 20 seconds interval, it got more than one gigabyte. It had even more than two gigabytes. So the the rule it's not limiting anything. It's just a uh, it's something that just triggers if it's passed over, regardless of how much data is there. So this will run forever and because these are 200k the state will be removed and uh, we'll run uh, indefinitely i'll stop it let me stop first the streaming the application streaming and i'll stop these two so now this uh, concludes my presentation. Let's have some questions. Let me switch back to the... Okay, so if you have any questions, please write them in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, I think we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Heather. So the question is, is it possible to process different types of records by Spark State for streaming? Yes, you can create your own objects uh the first step is serialization deserialization from whatever source you have kafka or json as you see you can take that native object and map them to whatever object you want then the next step is grouping you can do there whatever you want also it's only that i did choose to do with accumulator rows and accumulator groups you can do whatever you want there and the metrics it's the metrics that matters to you. Those metrics did matter to us, like byte size and number of records. But if you have other metrics, you can put there other metrics. Also the aggregation function, you can create your own aggregation function and use, use it inside that map state, group with state. Thank you for the question. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, the question is, is there a reason why you're in Scala Java over Python? Uh, first, uh, Spark is very nicely integrated with Scala. You have a lot of options there. Uh, you can use Python too, but there is some, there are some drawbacks in terms of uh, processing if you use UDFs, user-defined functions. So Scala seems to be faster than Python and Java, it's still a hassle to create some flows with it. So Scala is the best tool for using, for the best tool or language to be used with Spark. Spark is written natively in Scala, so it integrates very good with Scala. I have 20 CDC tables. I'm wondering if I can materialize a final SQL view out of these 20 tables with Spark streaming job. I think you can. It really depends on the schema that you want to output. So if you have multiple tables with different schema, you need to decide if your output is one table or multiple table or each table has an aggregated table outside. So if you have one-to-one -one mapping and you want to aggregate one table into a result table, you can do a query for each table. Otherwise, you can have multiple sources and merge them or union them or join them together and have another table. You can do, you're not limited by Spark in any way. It's only how you can do that. If your question is regarding the performance, Spark, it's as performant as the resources you give. I mean, if you can give him 1000 nodes, it can run with that. And also Spark structure streaming helps you with the exactly once processing. Yeah, my final job it's a join of those 20 tables, but CDC table data, it's coming in different schedule. Your question is if we can do that. Yes, it can accommodate that. Uh, the preferred way is to have multiples. I like, I don't know how to put it. The time interval at which you are triggering uh, the jobs should be somehow multiples from one from another. Usually you set it at the end, like you seen that I put it there, stream.write, write stream, and then I set the processing time there. Uh, you can set there whichever time you like, like maybe it's better for you to run the, the fastest. And if the data is stalling, I mean, no changes on a data set, that's no problem. There is not a problem, or you can run it slower and get all the changes in one go. So the, uh, if there, is there an easy way to check that you have only unique keys in your Spark streaming data frame? If you mean at the input one, the one that is transformed in the accumulator row, you use their drop duplicates and it makes sure that you don't have duplicates. If you are referring to the second one, the grouped uh, object, the accumulator grouped, the map group with state makes sure that you don't have any duplicate there. Guys, thank you very much for your time and for your questions. Great questions. Great questions for you. From, from your side, thank you. Um, I think we are over our time. Uh, thank you and see you later, maybe on other presentations.